guys, Drewski here, and I acted in SCP Overlord. If you don't know what SCP is or SCP Overlord is, I would not actually recommend Googling what SCP is at all, but I would recommend just searching up on YouTube SCP Overlord, watching the film first without any context whatsoever. I think that's the way to do it. Or, you know, also it's at the top of the description right below this video as well. Before you watch this video, I definitely suggest watching the actual short film. It's publicly free on YouTube, check it out. Again, link in the description and also the search bars right above this video probably. So SCP Overlord is a film about some operators raiding a compound or raiding a, a sort of a cult facility uh, in the middle of a forest in the backwoods of America in a universe kind of parallel to ours, which contains SCPs. SCPs, um, if you ever looked it up, it's like a big creepypasta sort of website that has tons of different types of entities and anomalies that do different things. There's anything from scary monsters to hats that make you invisible. Anything that is anomalous and breaks the laws of physics and things like that are considered SCPs. There's a foundation called the SCP Foundation, the Secure, Contain, and Protect Foundation that is built up to basically find and secure and protect these SCPs um, and keep them from damaging the public. Well, unfortunately, there's a cult that has some activity going on that seems anomalous and so the SCP Foundation is called in with some Spec Ops guys to go raid this compound. So that's where I come in. Uh, they made a film like this actually about a year back called SCP Dollhouse. And I was really interested once I saw this video. I saw it within two days, I think, of when it got released because one of my friends sent it to me, said, dude, I know you like SCP. And these guys, you know, these guys made this really cool short film about it. I saw the film, I w immediately was just in love with the design. You guys know that I love night vision goggles. I love SWAT teams and tactical gear and all that sort of stuff. So I geeked out over this video. I thought it was super cool. Um, bridging the gap between something like uh, Zero Dark Thirty and something like, uh, I don't know, Ghostbusters or uh, Men in Black. I just love that sort of gray area there that hasn't really been explored before. So I hit up Evan Muir, the writer of SCP Dollhouse, and I said, hey, could, you know, I, I, I want to somehow help in the next one. I think this is really cool in any way. I just want to, you know, see if you need any extra helping hands on this. And he said, yeah, come be an actor. So I was like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, that's fine. A year later, I'm on a plane to Kansas City uh, to meet people that I've never met before, to film a movie set that I've never been on before, and um, to become an actor, which I had never been before. There's just a random voice coming from a forest on the scene of an SCP set. I'm not sure if I like this. There's oi, 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 echo. Like I moved to the country to avoid this shit. <laughs> okay, so we are out in the middle of nowhere, nowhere in Missouri, and we're at this crazy set for SCP Overlord, which is a new series or a new movie, new film in the series of. SCP, it's just, there's just a voice in the forest saying oi. <laughs> Coming onto a set of a kickstarted film with a $20,000 budget, you're expecting a level of professionalism and business, you know, like sort of things going on. Um, when I got there, it was entirely the opposite. Uh, we had driven to the wrong location and we drove into an empty field nearby where we found some random dudes, Chad and Kyle. I mean, we're, we're stuck out in the middle of nowhere, Missouri. There isn't a paved road for 30 miles, and we're told to go to a field. Uh, we went to a field, nothing was there. It was obviously the wrong field. Why didn't you walk up the path? We went to the field! So shorts is a bad idea through here. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to the guy of the car who just drove past us. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't offer it at all either. Right? So let, he just made us walk. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately, I'm greeted by the effigy and Steven, the director, who I've played Halo with a few times at this point, but I have no idea the, the nuances and interesting uh, quirks about him that we'll get into. I had no idea about who he was really as a personal human. Um, <laughs> compared to who I knew from the internet, from emails and a few games of Halo. I would not want to walk up to this in the middle of the night while exploring. Just walk up to that and be like, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, okay, I'm enough, gonna enough. turn around. We'll Goodbye, spooky effigy. I'll see you tomorrow when you're on fire. The first night was basically just prep night. Everybody is throwing gear around, cameras are being opened up out of boxes, people are getting into the Airbnb and getting situated. 
a lot of stuff is going on within the hour that we're there. I was surprised by how busy everybody was. It was like, hey, you know, we're we're here, we're getting to work, we're starting to start, you know, prepping. We're not getting dressed in our costumes quite yet, but it, it's getting real really quick. What do you think about this room, this sleeping area, surrounded by 416s? Bro, I've never felt more secure in my life. <laughs> Airsoft 416s. <laughs> as far as cell signal's concerned. Yeah, I have none. Is there Wi-Fi here? This is how we're bunking tonight. <laughs> so here's my rifle, my vest for the film. Uh, I think that's David's rifle, and this is Colton's up here, and then down here is my helmet setup, which is pretty sick, looking pretty SCP, and uh, you can see they have meme patches for our vests, but uh, yeah, that's our, that's our setups for the film, which is going to be pretty sick. Sorry, what did you say about your feet? Do we have the cleaning, do we have the cleaning utensils? $5 for close-ups. Alright, so you check these out. There's is? more M4s than just the ones that we so had. And they're over off. here. Laying down. Look at these bad boys. Yeah. Big mm. thanks to Evic and Elite Force. Uh, Evic, Elite Force? Yep. Dude, that one's kind of cool. I actually really like that camo over there. Oh. That one's pretty sick. That's pretty. Look, did you... Look, the magnifiers have SCP on them. Hey! Look at this place. So we just woke up, it is day one of the shoot. Uh, my hair's probably pretty crazy, but this location is obviously um, very fitting for a horror movie out in the middle of America. I mean, look at this house. <laughs> look at this house, one sec. ISO auto, come on. We need a little bit more ISO than that, I think. What's crazy about these places Especially in Missouri, the grass is so green. Like I'm, I'm from Texas, so mind me. The grass is so green that these people have to cut it almost like every few days because it grows so fast. the The, the land is so fertile here. It rains so often. I mean, just look at this pond out in front of this house. Look how cool and cinematic of a shot this is. If you didn't have a shaky boy like me trying to be the cameraman. I mean, look at the view of this farmhouse. <laughs> this is so cool. Yeah, old school workbench with a vice. What's that over there? Is that another vice? Yeah, yeah, it's just missing the... Uh, gotcha, oh. yeah. That is crazy that this is made out of wood. Like, I wouldn't understand how the mechanics work inside to make that a hey, functional vice. Y'all want some bug spray and sunscreen? Dang! I feel like I'm in Texas when I see a sign like this. I feel like I'm with my people. With your people? Yeah, that's fantastic. Look at them fours they have set up. Okay, so last night we had a kind of darker view of these, but I'll give you guys a better view right now. So here's here's Uno M4. This is one of my favorites, actually. It doesn't have a foregrip, though. Get a Magpul AFG on there, boy. Here's another. So these are all going to have suppressors and sights on them once they're done. I really like that kind of like A10 Warthog sort of teeth look. And this is a pretty nice one. I really like this one a lot. This is like what I would want in an airsoft gun, honestly, this sort of setup. Maybe not the stock. I don't know what stock that is. I would rather have the 416 stock. But then they've got like the bronze 416s all weathered out and stuff. Mine isn't as weathered as this, though. Mine's over here, as well as my gear, as you can see. So mine has the bronze, and then it's got a Vortex uh, Huey on it. Or razor? I guess it's a razor. No, I thought it was a Huey. And then uh, got the nice 416 rail with a little suppressor at the end and a hollow sun actual peck box. Not really a real peck box, but close enough, you know, close enough. I'm, I'm the skinniest guy here. And I'm so, so hungry. Oh, there's just grapes and Joe Bonnie. No! Oh, there's tortillas. There's tortillas. the one on the second floor is blocked off with plastic to make sure that we have the movements and everything correct so we get the shot right. We can only do it once. Yeah. So no fucking about or whatever. Watch your footing. Don't fall. 
if at any point, if we're shooting and the effigy falls, don't react to it, just keep moving. We're just going to keep on doing the shot. Assume, like, as we're rolling, that we're just going to get whatever it is that we get. So if you, like, trip on something, just keep moving forward, keep doing your thing as if it was either intentional or, oh, it just happened. If you might have been able to tell on those first clips of the morning of day one, I guess, on set, I was really, really tired. My voice was about an octave lower. That's what happens when I don't get enough sleep. Uh, luckily, a lot of the first shots of the film were actually uh, really not including us that much. It was the briefing scene where uh, Katie is giving us the briefing and then uh, the MTF officer comes up and gives us another kind of partial briefing. Um, and a lot of that was just shots of Katie doing her part and the shots of the monitor and the shots projector and the other actors. So uh, there was this was all filmed in the basement of the house. So it looks like it was filmed in some SCP facility, but it wasn't. It was actually in the basement of the house where the operation took place in, which I thought was pretty cool. It's a weird little Easter egg. So the scene where Bassan shoots himself is the same exact scene and also camera angle that we have whenever we're facing uh, the, 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 I guess, the projector display in the basement, which is pretty funny. But they've got this whole foggy setup behind us, and I'm going to show you guys what they're doing up here. This is the first shot we're about to do in, like, literally five minutes. Throughout this filming, I was uh, laying back on a four-wheeler that was parked in the kind of under-basement garage area, and I actually got really, really comfy and fell to sleep for like an hour and a half while they were doing shots. And I cannot describe how comfy a four-wheeler can be when you didn't get much sleep the night before. And there's just a like a, a silent commotion in the room because, or a, a kind of a, a dull commotion because everybody is working really hard, trying to get the shots right. There's, there's a lot of talking, but it never gets really too loud. You know, the actress is saying her parts and her lines and the director is kind of um, telling her, okay, you know, you're gonna do the same lines, you're gonna do it this way, that way, this way. It was really monotonous, almost in a way, and very peaceful. So I fell asleep, I woke up feeling better than ever. I, I think it was honestly one of the best naps I've ever had in my entire life, and I was ready to take on the day. As you can see, the fog machine kind of got out of control, and uh, there's a little bit too much fog, so they're having to open a door over there just to get the fog out. I am currently laying on top of a four-wheeler, so that's a, that's a four-wheeler throttle. I'm currently just laying here. I actually took a nap while they're doing shots. Jansen, gloves, action. After this you know, relaxation period though, it got fast really quick. We broke for lunch, and if I remember correctly, on the first day, we did the effigy scene. And before that, we had to go over a whole firearm safety uh, instruction from the military advisor on set. Some of the rifles that the actors were holding in the film were actually real rifles, as well as, I believe, one or maybe two handguns. Uh, if you ever saw a close-up of a handgun in the film, it was usually a real handgun, just so it didn't have the silver chrome barrel of an airsoft pistol. Now, I can thank my dad for my firearm safety. I know that I'm pretty safe with guns, and I, I try my best to, you know, not flag anybody in any times. But even in a professional or relatively professional setting like this, uh, firearm safety sometimes goes out the window, and people just seem to overlook it sometimes. And so it's very important, especially with real rifles on set, even though they're totally unloaded, just to practice those firearm safety rules. And to have a military advisor there was very comforting, making sure that, you know, he was checking everybody for contraband, aka rounds in their rifles, because nobody wants to die on a movie set. Today. So we're going to have a lot of fun, but we're here to work, okay? And safety is going to be paramount. And uh, I take no bullshit uh, with safety violations and et cetera. Uh, I want you to handle your weapons just as you would if they're real, loaded, and everything else. We're not going to create any bad habits here. If I see you lasering people or flagging them or fucking around with your weapon in the wrong way, I'm going to get in your ass about it, okay? And if it happens more than once, then you'll have an option to either leaving or I'm leaving, one of the two, because we're not going to put up with that. We're going to have a safe try to make it look as realistic as we can from weapons handling all the way down. Uh, I, I appreciate any training you guys may have had prior and before this and, and whatnot, but if I'm tweaking something with how I want you to hold your rifle or maneuver with it, then go with it, okay? And, and have an open mind and, and take it as some, some teaching. Maybe some, maybe you'll learn something too, and I'm sure I'll learn from you guys all the same thing, okay? 
And then came the effigy scene. The effigy scene was difficult because, as Steven said before, we can only do it once. There's one effigy. There's only so much diesel fluid that we have uh, thrown on top of it to make it burn. And uh, yeah, so it's a it's a pretty tough shot to do. So we get up to this field um, in the golden hour. I think it was near sunset at the end of the first day. We had already filmed all the forest scenes and all of the like kind of the scene where we're all walking through the forest and uh, Kalinsky is throwing the glow stick into the, the SCP hole in the ground. And then uh, later in that day, we did the effigy scene. And the problem with this is that we went up to the top of the hill and then the Airbnb uh, landowner started to mow the pasture that we were in and get hay bales out of the pasture, which I've actually, I, I guess I call me a city boy, even though I grew up on a ranch, but I actually never have witnessed hay bales up close being shoved out of the back of a tractor, which is pretty cool. But, uh, <laughs> so we started to, to do hay bales while we were trying to get the shot in. So this field, 30 minutes before the shot, was entirely tall grass. Um, and they had mown a little circle around the effigy to make it look, you know, kind of cool. But it ended up being, I feel like, a better, more... Uh, well-composed shot with the hay bales in the background. It almost is like it added a more uh, higher level of depth to the shot. And what's funny is that there's people that have commented that they are CG hay bales. <laughs> Why would we add in hay bales afterwards in CG? I, I don't understand. But uh, somebody thought that those were CG hay bales. Yeah. What was cool about the shot is that although Steven was only seeing, um, or the camera was only really like looking at about half of the whole squad, um, the rest of the squad was also walking on the other side of the camera. So Steven could choose and pick whichever angle he wanted and just whoever wanted to, or whoever happened to get into the shot got into the shot. It's also made it really natural because then the formation was better uh, formed, I guess, because it was an actual formation. If half the formation wasn't there behind the camera, then it'd be kind of weird for the other dudes who were on camera to figure out where they would need to go in that half formation. So although the shot just can like contains Kalinsky and some of the other operators, it's actually containing all of us behind the camera, you know, making Kalinsky, if he glances to the left, he's gonna be glancing at one of the operators that's walking beside him. So just to add that extra little level of realism into the shot. Day one, few discrepancies, but this is the most important shot, and we have probably the best lighting conditions right now, and I'm really thrilled about it. This is really good, especially against all this uh, green. So we're just right now we're just really hoping. I wouldn't waste it. Just making sure it works. Uh, yeah. Get your gear on. So I can move the truck? Yeah. Or, I got it. Just I'll wait for the last. Oh, yeah. What if it doesn't set up right away? What if it takes forever to light up? Because I would just take a picture of the safe and there's just a picture of the safe. Don't look, come over here on the other side. Five, four, three, two, one. Take the shot. Fire extinguishers. Kyle, you tell me when you're ready. Ready? I'll cue you. Camera speed. Everyone get ready. Hold on. All right. We're good. Do it. Light it up. I think he's I think he's framing it so it works. After our first day of doing the forest scene and the effigy scene, I was destroyed. I don't really exactly remember, but as per my recordings that I'm about to show you, I think I was destroyed from this day. All right, so it's day two now. Um, so you might notice that the camera quality is slightly different. That's primarily because uh, I had to switch cameras. 
When I was upstairs in the cold, dry environment, this camera got really, really cold and dry, but now it started raining outside. So now this camera is super, super foggy. I have to basically wait for this camera to warm up because there's condensation all over the sensor, all over the lens. <sighs> so I have to wait for that to warm up until this is gonna be usable. So I have to use my phone. Yesterday was extremely difficult to the point where I was more sore at the end of yesterday than I have ever been from any airsoft game or anything like that. Any cross country event, I can't remember being as sore as I was yesterday. All we did was walk around, stand around, but doing that in the full suits, in the gas masks, in the backpacks, in the vests, in the harnesses, extremely encumbering and restrictive. So it started raining, obviously, today, so I don't really know exactly how we're going to do today because a lot of today was going to be outside and us entering the house as the MTF and doing all that sort of stuff but it's all gonna be extremely, extremely muddy and wet, so it's gonna be difficult to do that sort of thing. Uh, so I think we're gonna be doing a lot of indoor stuff today, which is good. That means that, at least in the earlier part of the day, we'll be inside, we won't be hot, we probably won't be sweaty. Thank God, because yesterday was insane. It was like only 85 Fahrenheit outside, but the fact that you're wearing that mask, you're breathing, you're rebreathing your exhaled air so much, and your entire face is so hot. Oh god, your entire face is so hot. It was uh, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done, probably, and that I, I might be a wuss, but geez, that was tough. All right, so I was able to wipe the sensor down, so most of it, you can still see some corner of it or something uh, that I didn't get with the microfiber cloth, but. Uh, I'm going to show you guys what the outside looks like right now. Hopefully we don't have to shoot outside today. <laughs> it is entirely wet. But yeah, we basically came back after filming yesterday. I didn't even get much film of yesterday because we were just so busy for the entire day. So all of this gear is... Someone's coming down the stairs. I'm going to film whoever it is. Someone's coming to that door right now. No? Man, it sounded like they were. But yeah, all of this gear was what we were wearing just yesterday. And this is just the raid team's gear. So nobody else's gear is here. This is six people's gear. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is my pile right here. My mask. Which is this badass thing. I know it's kind of a glary, fuzzy photo right now because of the fog. But uh, here's the end of my 416. It's crazy whenever you have, you know, f even just 15 actors that have to be fully kitted, how many problems the kits actually bring to the table. Um, we had so many issues with broken night vision goggle mounts, broken this, broken that, broken this, broken that. And then I've got my Glock here that is definitely somebody else's. I don't know whose Glock that is. That's just, actually, I don't know if that's a raid team member. Um, I think that's Corey's, I believe. His is really cool. And he's even got the modified Call of Duty Modern Warfare night vision goggles, which is hilarious. He's, they actually just painted them, and they somehow were able to mount them to this mount, which I don't understand how that works. But they somehow got the COD night vision goggles to mount to a helmet. And then I think this is David's hat, or David's mask. Yeah, all this stuff was super hard to put on, super hard to take off because there's just so much of it. And it's extremely restrictive once you're wearing it. Oh, hello! How was yesterday? It's a shit show. Shit show? But like... But we did it, it right? It was all right. Well, because right now we just have to work way fucking harder to yeah. get, uh, what's it called, back on schedule. Because yeah. we weren't able to do the beginning forest scenes. Mm -hmm. Which is okay, because it's not that much we have to do so basically we just need to get as much interior stuff done today to get a little bit ahead yeah and then when it clears up and stops raining go back out get those shots and hopefully it's not as humid mm -hmm. so people aren't like sweating dying yes so let me show you guys something um my m65 jacket that i wore yesterday it was so hot and humid that i didn't wear anything underneath it so it was soaked in sweat literally like i i could i could uh what do you call it squish the sweat out of it. I don't know what that word is. 
So right now I just have it set up on a fan. Yeah, so I set this up on the fan because it's still wet in the next morning. I stopped wearing this at like maybe 7 p.m. last night. It is still wet, so hopefully that will dry it off. I would like everyone to know I hate my life, but I want to die. After the first day of acting where I felt like I drank about maybe two and a half gallons of water that day uh, to maintain my life, uh, day two was very fortunately indoors and in 65 Fahrenheit, nice, cool, dry air. So it was a lot more comfortable. Uh, this day we were tasked with raiding the house. So the military advisor, Ty, uh, basically spent a very, very long time uh, going over every single detail of how we would breach the house, the methods at which we would uh, use to enter rooms, and the methods at which we would communicate to each other. And so basically, Stephen gave him the idea of what he wanted to, to film, and then Ty modified that idea into a militaristic fashion. As he comes in this room, there's something called walking the walls. It's an old adage. Because you're not, you don't get to actually walk the walls, but <clears throat> that's what you're looking for. You're looking for anything. It's not a deep search. It's a quick cursory for looking for any threat. You can miss something. That's why we always go back into a secondary to make sure we haven't missed anybody in closets, under beds, things of that nature. This is looking for immediate threats and, and whatnot. Go and cut it, and, but, but focus on your, focus on all that. So he knows I'm right here. So we're here. I'm gonna peel off. Guess what happens as soon as we just split? Who was third? You? You're right up my ass. So it's seamless that right after, if I'm breaking off, it's like you just, I just gave birth to you. And now you're fucking flowing through. Within an hour and a half, we went from a mismatched group of misfits who didn't know what we were doing. Okay, stop. Let's do it again. To a very organized crew of guys who knew how to breach a house. Um, this whole sequence was in one shot, so we couldn't mess anything up, and so we had to flow flawlessly into the rooms. And Ty did an excellent job at teaching us how to, and, and, and not even just how to, but also the reasoning behind a lot of the actions. So we didn't just know what to do for the camera shot, but we knew why we were doing it, and that gave us the context to help us flow into those movements and flow into those strategies and, and tactics that are used when clearing a real life house. Small room. Clear. Small room left. Coming out. Clear. With you. Clear. Coming out. Coming out. Clear. Clear. Talk me to second deck. Alrighty, so this is day three, I think. Maybe day four. I don't even remember because we've been doing so many things. <laughs> Looks like a movie, dude. Can you play that again? Because I miss like all the time. Right now, though, they're setting up the upstairs with tons of plastic and stuff. They're going to basically waterproof the entire upstairs for any splashes because David's neck is going to get cut by an invisible SCP. And I'm going to have to grab him with him bleeding out, basically, and him falling to the ground dead. So that's going to be fun, but right now, I guess this is the only time I've had free time in the last like day to talk to you guys. So yeah, I'm gonna go back inside and shoot what they're doing upstairs because they're gonna be plastering it all up. They're gonna be prepping David with his makeup and stuff because they're gonna have to hide a blood tube in his neck and then uh, we're gonna slice his neck open. Totally normal vlog. Hey David. Ready to get your neck cut? Ready to die. Get as far back as you can go, Chad. Tell me when. As far as you can go. I want to be able to pee in this hallway. Damn straight. Yeah. Yeah. And not for the guys, you know. Yeah. So our boots are so sharp against the plastic that we basically have to uh, double and triple layer the floor of plastic just because it's so freaking. Uh, like cuttable by our boots. Even standard Oakley boots like this, they'll cut the heck out of the plastic. So we have to 
triple, double, quadruple layer just to make sure that our boots don't cut it because we're going to be running through there. It's going to be a lot of people walking around. Oh, hello. Not even 900,000 subs to yeah, give us free views. What an idiot. Million, what a stupid a million idiot. Million. What a not bitch. even a million what subs. A bitch ass. And then he would do this. And, I, and it was like his little thing. Like, what the fuck is me? It's, it's to get my hips going. I played so much Stardew Valley, it's ridiculous. Turn it loose on it. Plug it out. Get out of here. <laughs> so in the scene where Lambert gets his neck sliced, uh, it's actually kind of funny. If you slow-mo it and, and look very closely, you can actually see me run out of the door. I'm, I'm grabbing and pulling Lambert, and it, again, this took so long to prepare this shot because we only had a few chances with this one too. We only had a, a certain amount of clothes if he got blood all over himself and we needed to redo the take. But I'm pulling Lambert out of the room and I don't know if it was the second take or if the hallway plastic was just slippery, but you actually see me eat it as I exit that room. I slipped on the carpet and fell and basically pulled down David with me. <laughs> so you see us fall in the background of the shot, but that wasn't, like, I don't think that was scripted. I think I actually fell trying to pull him out. I was trying to pull him out as fast as possible. I even hit him pretty hard against the wall. And this sort of scene, it's, it's hard to know what to do because you've never experienced firsthand someone's neck gets sliced and fighting against an invisible entity. So it's hard to figure out like, what should we do in this situation? Like David, for example, was laying on the ground and just perfectly still. And we would, we were telling David, hey, for this scene, your neck is cut. You have to fight us. You know, you really have to fight. And uh, David wasn't fighting us enough. And so we were screaming and like through our gas mask. And again, everybody was making mistakes like this at one point. But we were <laughs> in this scene where we're fighting to get Lambert's, you know, neck under control. Uh, we're basically screaming through our mask, David, fight me, fight me. <laughs> we're trying to get David to like push against us and cause a little scuffle in the floor. Because like if your neck's cut, you're going to be going crazy. You're not going to know what to do. You're, you're going to be just like trying to push everybody else's hands away and try to get control of your own self. You're not going to be thinking straight in that situation. But yeah, soon after that, I mean, the rest of the days kind of blended together. We filmed the basement scene. Uh, we filmed a little bit of the scene where the, the invisible man gets in the door. Hey, stop! I, uh, why? Oh yeah, we had the grenade scene where uh, they, uh, I think it was, oh, who was it? Somebody tells me to pull out a gas grenade. I pull out the gas grenade, I unpin it, and I throw it down the hall. And in one of the takes, I happened to accidentally uh, miss flick the pin, and so it kept on my finger as I went up to my rifle. Well, I wanted to do something cool, so I decided maybe I should flick the grenade pin after this accident happens, I should flick the grenade pin over at the camera. I thought that might be cool. And as soon as I did it, everybody said, oh my gosh, that looked super cool on the camera. And so that ended up being in the final film. The grenade pin flying at the camera was absolutely creative. And uh, I, I, I copyright that grenade pin flick um, for myself, uh, LLC, Operator Juski LLC. Thank you very much, it's mine. And after that, honestly, the production flew very fluidly, I guess. That's the best way to describe it. Uh, it was it was a fast run to the end of the film. We finally got done with our with our parts. We were able to sit around and watch some of the uh, outdoor team uh, come inside and actually recreate our scenes for the Foley or the, the background audio that was used in the final film. They had to recreate the scenes and get the audio of footsteps and plastic sounds and all that. So that was something that was... Uh, it was fun to watch, just sit back, relax, and watch other guys act and do all their stuff, and 
that was it. That was the entire filming of SCP Overlord. It was a lot faster than I thought. It was a lot, uh, I, I, I guess, both in the amount of speed at which we were doing things, but also in the speed of what five days can last. I mean, when you're getting up, working, going to sleep, getting up, working, going to sleep every single day for five days straight, it goes by pretty quick. It, it feels like a blast and you kind of forget which day you're on at some points. And remember at the start of this video when I said that the entire film set was unprofessional and, you know, unbusinessmanlike and all that sort of stuff? I say that because I've, I've been to places where it was boring, where it was businessmanlike and nobody was having fun and, you know, I've been to video game uh, conventions and video game releases that are just boring, businessmanlike and, and, and polite and, and not exciting and nothing fun is going on really, you're just trying to act your best and and uh, <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it other than just like be fake. Um, everybody here was very real. Everybody here was very skilled. Everybody here was very passionate and it was a mismatched crew of very effective movie makers is the best way to describe it. I think that Stephen Hancock and Evan Muir have a bright future ahead of them. And if you or anybody watching this is into um, filmmaking or investing in filmmakers, I definitely would suggest these guys. I mean, from my experience of being on their set, I wouldn't be giving them praise. I wouldn't be making this video unless I really liked my time on there. And I think that these guys deserve a little bit more exposure because this film was amazing. It was so much fun to work on. I would go back. I mean, I mean, nobody here on set was working for money. We were all working for free. It was something that I just wanted to do because it looked cool. And once I got there, I had fun and I would 100% do it again for zero cash. It was hard work. It was exhausting, but I would go back in an instant to do it all over again. Again, big thanks to Evan and Steven for letting me invade your movie set without even knowing who I am. I hope, uh, I hope the viewers really enjoyed this one too because it was a lot of hard work and uh, yeah I, I, I hope to uh, be in future movies maybe not be an actor but maybe at least help out in the future films that these guys have to do um, and yeah it was it was a pleasure boys so this has been operator Drewski and I will see you in the next one